Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill. I'm delighted again to be able to speak to CEO Sarah Barrington and Chief Medical Officer Michael Donovan of Verici DX, a next generation immunodiagnostics firm focusing on the global uh, kidney transplant market. So, uh, welcome, guys. Hi, Paul. Great to be back. Yeah, well, you've, you know, certainly the, the, uh, it's been a lot happening since uh, we last spoke. Um, not least the sort of the positive operating um, uh, update uh, today, despite it's obviously all of the uh, the financial uh, shenanigans going on and the collapse of uh, Silicon Valley Bank. But Sarah, I don't suppose you could give us a quick update on uh, on, on just how what the business has been doing in in, in the well in the background. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been very busy. So sometimes you have your heads down, um, you know, focus on uh, you know operational execution, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, I'm very pleased to um, to report that uh, obviously we're now in full blown uh, commercial launch. Uh, so late last year, as promised, we went out to the market. We got all of the information that we needed for what I call the the e, uh, using the easy button, uh, so that making our tests uh, ordered in a hospital situation is not complex and not a barrier to adoption. So we did that. That was what we had called our soft launch. Uh, and we did that. We worked with a number of centres to understand how each centre worked and how you would uh, how would you get that adopted uh, ready for the full blown commercial launch uh, of Tutivia uh, in January, which we did. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that, uh, you know, we're we're uh, very busy just uh, clicking off those milestones. Oh, good. Well, you're sad as though the engine is really firing on all cylinders there at uh, Verici DX. Now, Michael, um, just for the benefit of sort of investors, I mean, I don't think many people uh, know really what a chief medical officer do. I suppose you could give us a quick sort of like uh, one or a couple of sentences on, on your role there at Verici. Certainly. So uh, as chief medical officer, uh, one of the main areas is really responsible for the clinical efficacy of the test. And so you're really looking at that from a perspective of how will the individuals that will be using this test uh, do it in their clinical practice and assure that the data that's generated from the testing platform is actually uh, coincident and really reflective of what our, we're trying to accomplish with regards to transplant. So that's one of my major roles is really the messaging side and making sure both on both sides of that equation are actually adherent to what we're trying to achieve with regards to the accuracy piece, the clinical validation piece, the analytic validation side, as well as then its adoption within practice and how folks actually perceive the test, what we're trying to achieve with regards to the evidence that we're actually providing back to clinical care. So that's, that's probably the overarching view of a chief medical officer and the flip side of that is actually we're we're really working very closely with the commercial side of the organization marketing and all those elements that actually drive that messaging so i'm i'm very particular about how we actually say what we do what we have and how that can be used so you're really uh, i think my role is a combination of things both from the clinical side really adherent to the message and adherent to what we actually are providing as well as ensuring that the folks that are seeing the device the results of the test and how they will use it uh, in clinical practice. Well, brilliant. Let's just uh, sort of dive into that. Let's just, just hypothetically assume my name is Dr. Hill and I'm out in uh, one of the, uh, the, the the transplant centers out in the US. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what sort of like would be the key USPs and sort of like, you know, patient physician benefits of myself using the, um, you know, sort of two tivia post-operative test to sort of like, you know, in, improve the patient's uh, sort of outcomes, say versus existing sort of technology out there in the market? Certainly. So I think that, the, you know, what I share to physicians that are actually using a device such as this is to understand, especially within the transplant setting and in kidney transplant in particular, that the mechanisms that we use to actually, and the physicians use to control the immune system, really getting the patient for their transplant as well as post-transplant, how do you manage them? Because really the goal is to maintain the graft. That really is the driver. So you have mm -hmm. someone who's in need of a kidney and you're now you're going to find and identify a kidney to transplant into that individual. You have to ensure from a clinical perspective that their that kidney will actually survive the graft and continue forward with regards to the overall kidney health of an individual patient. So how to do that is really what we discuss with the physicians, how they're doing it today. I view it in some regards as a hammer is being used with regards to the immune system because the goal is to not have the individual reject their kidney. 
And so that is creating a physiologic biological setting where their immune system is suppressed to a degree so that they'll be able to receive the transplant and then be able to maintain that transplant. And that's used by immunosuppressive therapy and various tools that are available, but they're not very precise in those individual tools. And so that's been always a challenge within transplant. We have a series of medications that are used to dampen the immune system, to make that kidney survive the transplant and then maintain and function in a, in a normal way with regards to what the kidney role is. But there's a lot of challenges with that. And to start in suppressing the immune system, you can actually drive up infection because the immune system is designed to help the patient and any all of us in terms of managing what is the onslaught of bacteria and various antigens that are you're exposed to. And by suppressing that, you're actually uh, creating a potential area where you'd have challenges with regards to infection. As so well so, as so just on that, just on that, Michael, if, if I yeah. was that doctor, Dr. Hill, et cetera, and I've got a patient and I've just obviously surgically uh, implanted a, a kidney into the actual, the, the, you know, the, 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 the patient mm -hmm. sufferer, then, um, and he's, and essentially, I want to make sure that there isn't a problem. And let's say I do a blood test, existing blood test, and it comes yeah. out as a positive, i.e. there is a problem. How much reassurance can I take from the existing test compared to if I was using replacing that diagnostic with, say, two tivia? So the, you know, again, so the, the role that a lot of the tests that are out there, some are just basic function tests with regards to that individual patient and what they need to, what we use as tools to be able to understand what the overall impact would be on a transplant and rejection. And that's challenges because those are very uh, non-specific, very, sort of very almost uh, not very quantitative with regards to that individual patient's profile. They're helpful but not supportive of really being able to fine tune what would be your like, how would you actually go about uh, modifying drugs and modifying the approach to that individual patient? Whereas to tibia, now you're getting to a whole nother level of understanding with regards to the immune system. So it's really creating a precision medicine setting of a very complex immune state, and then being able to adjust that by using that information. So for example, if a patient is at high risk, based on Tutivia's results with regards to their transplant rejection, then you would use that information to potentially drive how you would modify, modulate, change different drugs, make sure that you're actually really carefully monitoring that patient, especially within that very early period where you can have both different types of your immune system involved. And there's different activities, don't want to get too clinical or yeah, sure. logic, but there's a necessity to be able to become more precise in that management of that patient, specifically at that juncture where they've just received their transplant and they can be prone to rejection from a variety of sources. Our current tools don't allow you to have that degree of precision. They just tell you sort of a very generalized state, but they don't really get to the level of understanding of the immune system and what that actually means for any given patient. So it's a much more, I think, uh, precise way of really getting at that information more effectively. Mm. I saw in the operating, I saw in the operating update, it mentioned that it was uh, about three times more sort of precise than the existing test on the market. Is, is that about right? That is correct. And I think part of that is, and, and the existing tests on the market are looking at a very different biological perspective of rejection. So uh, there's different tools such as cell-free DNA versus the transcriptome. They are completely different with regards to their uh, evolution and what we're actually measuring in the context of blood. And so the, the transcriptome, which is really what Tutivia, that RNA processing, is able to look at differential expression of genes with regards to that immune pathway. Whereas in the cell-free DNA setting, we're actually looking at constructs such as ap well, apoptosis, so cell death, as well as ischemia, so yeah, okay. dying from, less, from lack of blood supply. So there are very different physiologic mechanisms between the cell-free DNA properties and the transcriptome. And there's really e evidence that is quite uh, prevalent throughout really, biological uh, history to understand that differential and why it's so important to use a transcription effort to understand differential components. Okay, and then so so if I I'll just continue with that, if I'm Doctor yeah. Hill, etc., and I'm using I'm looking at a sort of like a, a high risk um, 
uh, mm -hmm. recipient. And I've just said, as I implanted that 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 that, that uh, part, the uh, the kidney, etc. And I'm worried that this patient is going to is going to struggle. Then, how quickly can I use the two tivia test compared to uh, the existing ones on the market to get a good sort of precise um, and an, an accurate uh, diagnosis or not diagnosis? So, based on our uh, validation studies, which is from the, in the clinical trial, demonstrated that you technically and clinically should be able to use Tutivia within that first month. So soon after really you have transplant that you would understand sort of the patient's ability to uh, mount an immune response and uh, attack their kidney. And that's really the most critical area is that period of time within one month to even six months or less that you're really trying to drive that point home into tibia. Because of the nature of this broad assessment of the immune system with regards to the RNA profiling piece allows you that precision, allows you to understand the impact that the patient is having with regards to this transplanted kidney and the impact on their immune system for promoting a regeneration action response. So it, it allows you that selectivity. It allows you to understand what that means in the context of an individual patient. It gives you this more accurate, unbiased, differential view of immune response, which is very important, especially in the high-risk setting where you really need to act quickly to be able to monitor, to change your immune suppression profile, and really drive forward with the clinical care that's necessary to maintain that kidney for a long term. That's really why I think that it's so significant. And that also the clinical trial studies demonstrated that we're able to understand some of what is impacted on in these transplanted kidneys, this BK nephropathy, this associated viral response, and that ability to separate that that response from an actual immune response with association with rejection is currently not available with regards to this understanding of disease, especially at the time of a transplant. So it, it has all those parameters that drives it in more of an a, a early response that you need to be able to drive forward with Tutivia to be able to be that precise in your management of those patients. Okay. And then just in terms of the sort of initial feedback from the three sort of like um, transplant centers. What are the sort of, what have you been hearing from sort of doctors so far who have used the test? So, so far what we're seeing is that I think that there is a, a, a tremendous uh, view in the space to have a much more precise and appropriate response to an individual patient and to do that through tools that are much more exact and broad with regards to their view of the immune system. Because I think what, what I hear and understand from folks is that in the transplant setting, which is unique to medicine in general, is that they're intersecting with a very complex area such as immune understanding and transplant and how, and the tools that are needed to be able to to navigate through that area of medical biological science is not easy to do. And I think that they understand that the current tools are certainly not sufficient and that does impact on kidneys and especially with the long-term survival of these kidneys. We know that there is injury at that very early stage. So there has been a tremendous, I think, up understanding and would love to see it and use it more in their clinical scenarios because I feel that the messaging I get is that they need it. And they don't have anything right now to help really drive forward with some of these immunosuppressive tools, which are themselves are not benign. And so they're managing both a therapeutic and a management setting using tools that are somewhat old. And the, the way to approach kidney and post-transplant uh, individuals has been really limited. So they're innovative with regards to what they need because they understand the complexity of what the output of that is. And so I view it and hear that it, there's an extreme desire to have something like this in this clinical setting setting mm. and then just sort of like quickly sh sort of shifting gears to the sort of like the certification of the uh, laboratory recently i know this was a major sort of like milestones for the firm Can you just give us a bit of sort of like a color on the significance of that and whether dr hill can order this uh two tibia <laughs> test pretty quickly certainly and that that's what does allow us to do this right because you have a clear laboratory a clear certification is part of that in process from a regulatory side that allows you to go through the rigors of be a clinical grade laboratory that actually can provide this test to providers that need it across the United States. So that alone, that level of up really rigor 
factor that goes into the CLIA regulatory side is quite significant and powerful for a clinical lab such as, as uh, Verici. And one of the things that I think gets lost in that is that the uh, pristine and, and exquisite nature of this test, which is the transcriptome, it's RNA from blood, that's actually defining a signature that's associated with transplant. That's not done to, to in traditional laboratories. And the fact that that was went through that rigorous process of an analytic and clinical validation to get CLIA approval to offer this test to the clinical space is quite a significant achievement for tests such as this. It does, this does not happen. So I think people need to understand the power behind what went into that, but also the rigors of a CLIA and inspection that allows you to get that stamp of approval from the clinical space because they're allowing the lab to actually provide this to patients and their providers. And it's a significant mm -hmm. achievement milestone for the company. Yeah, and I guess it's it's sort of a, a, an absolute requirement to get uh, Medicare and, and Medicaid. Um, the only uh, way. <laughs> yeah, it is the only okay. way. It is part of that. You know what you have to go through to be able to achieve that sort of coverage and reimbursement activity, which is really critical for any company that's in this diagnostic space or any diagnostic space for that matter. That this is the process you go through. We got a we got our code. We went through that whole process to get to. To this point now you have a CLIA clinical laboratory that is allowed to be able to offer this test that's a huge achievement and especially in this environment with this test so that's why I think those are really uh, strong messages that really the community needs to understand because again this is it's not like a, it's a straightforward test this is a, a I think an exquisite way to understand something which I think that's why there's such uh, interest from the clinical community in this device. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I know you're really busy there, Michael. So um, I'll uh, uh, we'll say goodbye and uh, look forward in chatting going forward. So thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Paul. Good to see you again. Brilliant. Um, now, um, now, Sarah. Just in terms of the sort of the um, the key benefits of um, Clarava and the sort of commercialization, can you give us an update on um, what's happening there? Because obviously, this is another major sort of like uh, diagnostics for the firm. Absolutely. Um, as you recall, um, what we did is we took an extra six months to uh, expand the numbers. You know, essentially, um, I think it's about publication appeal, something that uh, breakthrough um, certainly needs the numbers to be in the high impact journal. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. Um, you know, obviously, there's a high degree of interest in Clarava. Um, and, you know, it's the pre-transplant test. It's called the kind of crystal ball test because yep. effectively you're um, looking at the patient's response. You don't know anything about the organ. You don't know anything about the matching. You're just literally going on uh, on the basis of the um, uh, the patient. Uh, but we could see good distinction there and useful information going forward in an area where the clinician has nothing. You know, they use clinical factors. They they know they're not particularly helpful. Uh, there is no other test. And so I think um, I think we're looking forward to to be able to make some good announcements on that shortly. And there's no other diagnostics in the market, is there? Because, I mean, essentially, the, I'm guessing the technology used, the, you know, the, the transcription um, RNA um, sort of like um, profiling, because it's working off the immune response, it's, it's specific to the actual patient before the, obviously, the, op the operation. And therefore, if you use existing technology, there's going to be no debris in the, in the blood to actually, you know, sort of like pick up. So, so the existing technology just can't work pre our operation presumably it's only yes, the, exactly. the actual immune system yeah yeah i mean um uh yeah exactly there are no other technologies uh it seems that dr hill's got that right so uh <laughs> um, but um yeah um you know a pre-transplant test is is very difficult to do you know rna um is is it's like a signaling it's a, a good message system it's you know it is the ability to if you're picking up that that signaling you're you're basically getting messages to that are going to the uh you know all, all the way through the patient's body and therefore mm -hmm. it's a good insight into what they're going to do and how they're likely to uh react you know that predictive element um you know gives you a risk score and actually sometimes goes contrary to if you like the traditional measures of um of risk you know one of the things we talk about is generalized population wide risk so for example age gender uh demographic etc um those are if you like 
um, general population wide characteristics that we make some assumptions on risk about has very little to do with the individual um, patient. And that's the leap forward that we're making. And this is the precision that was Michael was talking about is when you're actually being able to listen to the, the patient at an individual level and see what they are saying and get their risk score. Um, it's very, very powerful. So we find that, you know, you may have been put in high risk traditionally, um, you know, um, with, with, without the, you know, without any testing, you get this massive dose of uh, immunosuppressant um, because, you know, effectively, you, you know, preservation of the graft is all, and you didn't need it. And, you know, you don't get any of these drugs without some kind of side effect or, you know, price mm. to pay. There's a value component here. And so Michael will always talk about the, the balancing act that's going on in the clinician's mind. Do I give too much or do I give too little? I don't know what to do. So any information that enables them to distill down a view to the patient and treat appropriately at the patient level um, is incredibly powerful. And just if you bring that sort of the uh, the chlorava and the two tivia test together, if I was again putting on my Doctor Hill hat here, then that would give me um, give me insight into sort of the potential reaction pre, and then obviously the actual reaction post. Um, you know, it, it, with much better accuracy, I presume, and I can change the treatment regime both, even if I have to do anything something pre. I don't know. I mean, what's the sort of like the putting those two together? What what's the sort of the the synergies? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, for 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 a start, um, at the point of, of surgery, um, there is obviously uh, an immediate therapeutic response mm -hmm. uh, given by the clinician, and you know, Clorava can inform that. Uh, and going forward, but obviously you're migrating into issues where you ha have the interaction with the organ. So it's not just patient specific, it becomes the wider reality mm. of the matching the organ and the patient. Right. And then that of course goes into tutivia. And, you know, we've always said, and, and you know, if you recall, we've got a third in the pipeline, it's much mm. longer term uh, with a Protega that's, uh, you know, we finished enrolling and, and um, but, you know, we follow those patients for, for two years. Um, but the point was, was always that they would all inform one another and you would have a platform. Um, I think that the, um, the promise of RNA signatures are enormous and they don't, they're not just limited in, in transplant, of course. Uh, this is, you know, a huge platform play, um, you know, but we're, we're very focused on that. And to be able to um, have a trial where we had all three products in and eventually we can show the interactions and the benefits of, of effectively a, a, a big tr decision tree, having those points of information along the journey, I think are quite compelling. And when you've got you've got two tivia in the market now, which obviously was really ramp up once we get in, you know insurance cover probably in the second half, etc. Yeah. And then and then we've got Slokarava, which should be I think you meant you've indicated towards the back end of this year, maybe early next year, but but pretty soon anyway. Certainly yeah. the next twelve. It's only the next twelve months. And then when, when we've got, got uh, Protegia, we've got that sort of like, is it what, 2025 or so? Or... Yeah, I mean, that will be further out. Um, yeah. You know, obviously we closed enrollment, I think in January. Um, so you've got uh, two years for the full validation set. Um, you know, we will be able to pull off interim information along the way uh, mm. to have, have a look at that. But yeah, that's a longer term play. Um, I think it also... Um, is one where, you know, we talk about the research uh, asset, as it were, and I think that one is very much um, likely to be of interest as well for collaborations in terms of drug development. Um, so, yeah, a longer term play, but one nevertheless that um, if you don't get started, uh, yeah. you, know, uh, you never get to. So, um, uh, and I think we've got more than enough to do to commercially launch yes. and, uh, and get adopted to other tests in that time. So. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I, I think we'll be busy. Um, yeah, okay. but, um, but yes, it's very exciting to see the long term future of the company as well. And I understand you got sort of like um, two patents um, awarded as well, or you got some patents just, just recently. So, so all, the, is, all the technology yeah. is under, all under lock and key then, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, um, in terms of uh, we, we have a number of, as you know, the way that the patents are, they're not all in one jurisdiction. Um, so we have had uh, patents granted internationally 
um, up to this point, but I thought it was you know significant given that we're commercially adopting into the US first to have those mm. under lock and key. I always say that that you know effectively when you're looking at uh, preserving your competitive position, patents is one element of it. Execution, of course, is another. Uh, technology and so on and so forth. But but the patents are an important component. Um, I wouldn't ever want to totally rely upon that as as full protection. But essentially, what we've got is is um, we've got a sort of central hub of. Pro, uh, of patents, those you know were obviously licensed through Mount Sinai, and, and and those are being granted. And as the company moves forward, of course, we'll have more and more protection around those as we make new discoveries. Um, so mm. you know, it's a sort of never-ending cycle of of filing and granting and and protection. Good. And then, just in terms of the, I know you don't need um, FDA approval to actually to actually start selling because you know it's not under there. But uh, uh, is the business going to think about sort of like um, getting FDA authorization just for the sort of like in you know endorsement value? But or is it is it something which is uh, still still undecided? No, I, I mean I think it's useful. So so where you really need FDA is if we were going to distill this down into a kit and send it out to mm. the source. Um, yeah. You know, it is quite a complex test. It's well suited to being run uh, by my excellent team um, in our um, lab who, um, you know, who are able to perform it with a level of precision and robustness yeah. that you absolutely need. Now, you know, sometime down the, the line uh, when technologies get a little easier and we can distill this down into a kit and, and a training package uh, and a software uh, that may be uh, where we look at, um, um, you know, look at FDA mm. approval. Um, so at that point, but there really is no need and it will be yeah. completely at our choice. OK. And then just putting all this together, how big is this addressable market? Then we've got sort of like, uh, I mean, I'm looking at sort of like CareDX, the sort of the industry standard. I mean, I think they generate around about sort of like $200 million just from their sort of like, you know, uh, kidney tests. So this is a pretty big market, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the KDX numbers, I looked, I think for 22, they were about uh, 260 million, what they call testing yeah. services. That's probably, uh, that covers both heart and kidney um, in the transplant area. Uh, they have some other uh, revenue sources as well. Um, you know, we don't know the breakdown of that 260 million between heart and kidney. Uh, I've mm. always um, heard that it may be, maybe uh, half and half. Either way, it's, it's, uh, it's a big enough uh, revenue figure for, uh, for for a little old company like Breachy to be quite yes. excited about that market. Addressable market, you know, it's always an interesting uh, calculation. We calculated ours for, for uh, you know, being about 5 billion. I've seen no numbers in the industry that are bigger than that. Um, you know, once you get into anything with billions in it, I'm like, okay, that's big enough. Um, <laughs> so we're okay there. Um, we've got enough to uh, to to get going, um, you know, uh, in our uh, commercial launch there. Okay, okay. And then just terms in with the, the commercial launch, the funding of it. Obviously, we've got sort of a lot of money in the in the bank uh, at the moment. We've got nine point eight million dollars at the end of um, twenty twenty two. How long should that sort of like um, last in terms of uh, the points in commercialization and timescales? Yeah, we've extended it. Um, you know, we continue to be uh, very mindful of our purse strings. Um, mm. So at the moment, we're looking at uh, mid 2024. Uh, there may be some, you know, extension in that. Um, um, you know, that was far, far enough for us at the moment. We'll keep on doing that. Uh, those sort of cost review sessions. Um, I think it's enough for the time being, you know, to get through some major milestones when you're looking at what we've got coming up. The company is going to be, you know, in a different place at the end of the year. Um, yeah. You know, we're in that situation where we just keep clicking off the milestones and you keep changing in actually a radical risk structure or risk viewpoint of the of the company. Uh, and that's where, you know, um, you, you do those fundraisers as you go. Um, yeah, sure. So um, I'm, I'm quite pleased, actually, uh, in terms of of how we've managed to. Uh, you know, keep the business uh, laser focused and very uh, cost efficient. Uh, and a shout out to my team who work extremely hard. Yeah. And then just on the um, the operating uh, update, you mentioned you're exploring strategic options to increase the sort of sales distribution. Is there any a bit of extra colour that uh, potentially you could uh, give no, people just, or are you going to stay stubborn on that one? Yeah, I, I've always said that we'll, 
we always consider all options um, okay. and we're very open to ideas. Um, and I think a number of people are saying, you know, how do you, you know, beyond this first year of commercial launch, how, how are you looking to, to scale up? And we have a number of options. We could fund and do it all ourselves. Uh, let's face it, um, you know, with the with the progression of products that we've got, that that wouldn't be a horrible idea. Um, mm. But there are always alternatives uh, in terms of distribution deals. Um, you know, other people have sales forces that may not be 100% utilized. Um, and um, I do consider those. We talk to everybody uh, that we can and uh, keep all options open. Um, and so I just wanted to indicate the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm not particularly closed minded in terms of our strategy. We try and work the most efficient way. Um, you know, certainly in research, we're very collaborative uh, and very open to those ideas. Uh, and, um, you know, we do believe that, that there's not much point in always doing everything yourself. And there are ways to do this going forward. So uh, it's more an indication that we keep an open mind in terms of how we grow and we, we try and keep as flexible uh, as possible to any kind of good opportunities that come our way. Yeah, well, certainly having best in class technology puts you in uh, an excellent position. So just finally, in terms of sort of like um, news flow, I mean, put a game, putting my Dr. Hill on the hat on, when's the, uh, the, the results for the uh, Clarava coming out or the early, that, those early ones? And I presume we've got the prelims in, uh, in April. Yeah, we've got results uh, roadshow. Um, we've got Clarava coming up in Q2. We'll have publications out. Um, excited about that. Um, obviously, we're going through the track with Medicare. Um, mm. You know, one of the things I think is very significant for this company is that um, the majority of patients are in, uh, covered by Medicare. Um, so nationally, that percentage is 65% of all transplant patients, uh, Medicare and um, uh, Medicaid. Um, we obviously are targeting the states that are more Medicare he heavy uh, to be more efficient. And we're working through at the moment in terms of the price. We've already put that file in uh, and we're working on submitting the coverage. So this year is all about sort of getting the other side of that, that hump, the CMS hump. Um, obviously, we don't ignore private payers. They are a smaller proportion, um, you know, and one of the things uh, that we do is we, we register and we, we basically will work our way through that. Uh, and that's a gradual rollout. But for us, our main focus is, is Medicare. And, and that's really what I'm looking at, at, at achieving this year. Brilliant. OK, well, thanks very much, um, Sarah. and look forward in uh, touching base, um, hopefully probably in, um, in April or um, when the Clara results come out. So thanks again. Real pleasure. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. Bye. Take care.